It is no longer a secret that non-governmental organizations, NGOs, and the Arab world in general are founded to compete with the existing systems by garnering the satisfaction of the liberal governments in the United States and Western Europe who finance them. The liberal and neoliberal systems have been for some time now loud in embracing identity rights while excluding economic rights in what is perceived as the third world. They do that because economic rights are exploited for capitalist marketing by creating markets and goods that target the purchasing power of these emerging and transnational identities. They do that through political activists who turn into employees at NGOs playing an imperial cultural role. The cultural field is one of the most important fields the NGOs use to strive globally for the political right to express oneself but not the right to redistribute wealth or to demand democracy politics, but not economic democracy. Today, there are at least 50,000 non-governmental organizations in third world countries receiving more than $10 billion in funding from international financial institutions and from government agencies and local governments in the European Union and the United States of America. Managers of the largest NGOs manage budgets value at $1 million each, with salaries and benefits that can be compared to that of chief executives. This has been evident in the socio-political activism of NGO employees in Lebanon over the past 20 years. Recently, with the spark of October 17th protests in 2019, popular speakers in Lebanon focused their criticism on the Lebanese Central Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, multinational companies and private banks, basically against all those who set the macroeconomic agenda for pillaging Lebanon. However, when the disgraceful impact of structural adjustment policies on pensions and wage workers, peasants and local businessmen generated massive public discontent, suddenly the NGOs entered the picture. The NGO role in Lebanon was evident in trying to confuse and distort this popular discontent away from a direct attack on the banking power structure and its profits, which avoids the class analysis of imperialism and capitalist exploitation. Welcome to the Mideast stream. I'm Marwa Osman. As part of its foreign policy, the U.S. as an imperial power has been busy financing and supporting overseas religious, social, political and environmental institutions known as non-governmental organizations to control the exploited people and to deflect their resentment towards conflicts, religious rivalries and local divisions for the ultimate purpose of regime change. To discuss this issue with us from Beirut is Ali Murad, expert in Middle East politics. Thank you for being with us, Ali. Now, it's no longer a secret that the NGOs are a serious global political and social players operating in rural and urban areas, uh, and it has long been associated with the, laws, uh, with the roles of their uh, financiers, whether in Europe or the United States of America. Now, roles of NGOs have been uh, particularly visible in Lebanon over the past 10 years, um, some have gone as far as actually implicate themselves in the um, current and recent, very recent uh, uprisings uh, in Lebanon known as the Lebanon uh, protests. Now, how much truth are these skeptical roles of the NGOs in Lebanon? Thank you for having me first. Uh, you know, since 2008, you got thousands of NGOs that have been uh, established in Lebanon. Uh, out of uh, those thousands, you got like two or three thousand of those NGOs that are being funded by foreign countries and um, private foundations, uh, basically in the United States and Europe. Um, those um, NGOs have been active uh, politically um, at least since 2015. And uh, since then, uh, they are being active uh, during the, uh, the whole uh, situation in Lebanon that outbroke uh, since the first appraisal in 2015. And now, uh, since the uh, October 17th appraisal, they are in the streets, uh, they are protesting, they are uh, rioting sometimes. Uh, and I believe that um, due to the rhetoric that those NGOs are using, um, there had been some uh, skepti skepticism about 
um, their, uh, you know, their uh, uh, the stances they are trying to promote uh, dealing with the state, the, the Lebanese state, and even with the relations, the external relations, um, even with the Zionist entity, and, and a lot of, uh, of uh, stances that those NGOs have taken since five months now have made a lot of people and um, you know uh, analysts go that uh, those people have been um, acting on behalf of external powers and basically the United States to try to uh, fulfill some targets uh, regarding the uh, status quo in, in, inside Lebanon. And on top of this is targeting the resistance mm -hmm. and uh, trying to promote a uh, stance for normalization between Lebanon and uh, the Zionist entity and you know the, the oil uh, and gas uh, dispute regarding the borders. Uh, a lot of um, you know a lot of uh, subjects now are being discussed in, in Lebanon that made a lot of analysts uh, analyze and conduct that those NGOs uh, are, are are fulfilling an, an a foreign uh, agenda. agenda. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, adding NGOs around the world have become the latest means of transference for the ambitious, educated class, like the academics and the journalists, uh, who have abandoned their previous journeys in activism, whether it's leftist movements or other movements, but simply because they are not hefty in income-wise. Now, uh, they have uh, traded all that for a lavish life, life that looks like a life of an executive uh, manager yeah. and uh, it brings them a lot of uh, money and it bringing with them those people have came along and brought with them their organization and uh, maybe oral skills that could get people all around them that could group people and especially with uh, populism involved a lot of populism what makes lebanon such a fertile soil for this vast number of ngos uh, you mentioned the leftists. In Lebanon, you, we have a lot of uh, leftist uh, movements that uh, um, used to operate inside Lebanon for decades. Mm -hmm. uh, after the, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the, um, the whole communist uh, uh, camp, um, those movements were like orphans. They, they don't have uh, funders anymore as they used to be. Uh, during the last uh, the, the decades before the 1990, uh, those leftists um, culturally they are um, against some uh, principles that are being adopted by a, a, a majority in Lebanon, and uh, the the, uh, the Western uh, the Western uh, regime, the Western hegemony regime, uh, made use of the corruption inside Lebanon. And um, the, uh, the fact that uh, high percentages and rates of poverty and unemployment taking place in Lebanon since uh, like uh, a decade at least. Uh, so they were recruited, uh, they were penetrated, and they were, uh, and the most dangerous thing, they were manipulated culturally mm -hmm. uh, in a way that they abandoned their uh, leftist and m Marxist uh, ideas and they turned to the opposite. To, to the, the liberal, liberal front. Yeah, the, to the liberal front. And this is the most dangerous thing that took place in Lebanon. And we are talking about um, since 2008, mm -hmm. you got a lot of leftist movements that turned uh, to the opposite, and uh, they are now uh, they are now adopting um, the uh, the neoliberal thoughts and principles. So the Americans, basically, uh, if you are talking about the State Department mm -hmm. and uh, its branches and agencies like the USAID and the uh, the so-called National Endowment for Democracy, uh, with all its branches, the International Republican Institute, the National Democratic Institute and the CIP, CIPE, they all worked on funding uh, those leftists, ex-leftists, and so on. They, uh, we, we, got, uh, f uh, we moved, actually, from hundreds at the beginning of the last decade 
now we got thousands of them mm -hmm. in, the, in the streets. Well, but at the same time, Ali, we have a serious business in a country like Lebanon where the majority of the people in Lebanon who follow the resistance axis, they fight against, it's the largest group that actually fights against imperialism and Zionism. Yeah. Has the reality of NGOs in a country like Lebanon made it maybe harder to focus on these rules which are anti-imperialism and anti-Zionism, especially given the fact that we have corruption in our governance as well? Yeah. Has this made it a bit harder for the resistance to operate? First of all, we have to admit that the number one incentive uh, for this is the uh, the, the corruption uh, that has been governing inside Lebanon. The corruption in the state made the, the, uh, the basis fertile for uh, such penetrations by the U.S. Uh, and its allies inside Lebanon to try to exploit the situation. Uh, so I, I believe that um, uh, the, 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 the circumstances that uh, uh, where um, the, the outbreak that happened in uh, unemployment and uh, the poverty, that was a, a, a big environment for recruiting a, a lot of people uh, to join the civil uh, liberal army mm -hmm. that is being formed uh, not only in Lebanon. Uh, for, uh, we, you got more than a, a Middle Eastern country now uh, the Americans are operating civil armies to reach their goal of the change, uh, the regime change. Mm -hmm. uh, so I believe th that even uh, uh, if uh, people are uh, are needy and they are protesting in the streets, I believe that the majority of them are are still um, um, sincere about their feelings toward imperialism and mm -hmm. Zionism. And we, we saw the, uh, you know, the, uh, a, a, as a, an example, we one saw like... The, uh, one three, of the protests with one months, of the tents that was yeah, actually propagating pro-Zionist uh, yeah, uh, promoting terms, uh, if you will, uh, and uh, normalization, logic, yeah. and it was so brought I, down. Yeah, it was brought down by the protesters. So by the protesters I, I, themselves, We have definitely. to be optimistic about... Uh, but that what, 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 I've, what yeah. I've noticed in the role of NGOs, in maybe in Lebanon specifically, because we're directly in, involved with them, or we, we directly see their uh, activism, it appears that they have contradictory roles, especially in politics. On the one hand, they criticize what they uh, refer to as dictatorship and the uh, violation of human rights. But on the other hand, they are in competition with the radical socio-political movements, uh, trying to steer popular movements towards cooperative relationships with the dominant liberal elite, rather than actually fighting back their destructive policy, especially with the banking systems in Lebanon. But to look closer, are these political trends actually really contradictory, or they are complementary here? Well, when you say that uh, the rhetoric of uh, anti-dictatorship and uh, human rights abuses uh, being committed by the regime and the state, um, this rhetoric uh, is being used as a cover mm -hmm. by, the, by those Malin uh, NGOs. Uh, by the way, we are not uh, trying not to We're not talking about local NGOs all, here, all but we are NGOs, talking about yeah. internationally funded NGOs. Exactly. So uh, you, you got a part of those NGOs that are, uh, are being funded by foundations like the George Soros Open Society Foundations, uh, and the Ford Foundation and a lot of a group of foundations in Europe, those foundations, uh, they are focusing on the cultural aspect uh, to turn those people to, to uh, unknowingly abandon the principles, the cultural principles that govern, uh, govern uh, that has governed since centuries in, in our region. Mm -hmm. So w when we say that uh, um, there is a contradictory role. I believe it depends on the agenda of the funder. Mm -hmm. when, when the funder is the U.S. State Department, they have to stick to the agendas that uh, the State Department uh, mm -hmm. uh, imposes on them. Uh, when we are talking about um, private foundations, those have their own uh, conditions and their own, um, you know, um, 
orders mm -hmm. that are being ordered uh, uh, to be well, uh, fulfilled. So this, this practically is a very uh, vast and deep uh, issue that we need to discuss yeah. further, inshallah, in other episodes. Thank you very much, Ali uh, Murad, expert in Middle East politics, for talking uh, with us about the role of regime change Thank of you. NGOs. Please stay tuned for our next segment. An estimated 80% of the population, 24 million people, require some form of humanitarian or protection assistance, including 14.3 million who are in acute need. Now, severity of needs is deepening, with the number of people in critical need is staggering 27% higher than last year. Two-thirds of all districts in the country are already pre-famine, and one-third face a convergence of multiple vulnerabilities. Yemen human rights, Yemen humanitarian crisis worsening in this following report. Just one step away from famine. Close to 240,000 people are already living in famine-like conditions in some locations. Hunger is most severe in the areas where there is constant Saudi bombardment. Humanitarian aid is increasingly becoming the only lifeline for millions of Yemenis that receive so little due to the continuous Saudi blockade. To talk uh, with us about the humanitarian crisis in Yemen with us from Sydney is Jay Therapel, who is a member of the International Solidarity Committee with Yemen. Thank you very much for being with us, Jay. This report was really heartbreaking there. Uh, even if a political solution is achieved in the upcoming weeks or even uh, months in uh, Yemen, the humanitarian crisis will just continue, maybe even worse than it is right now. Millions of people continue to suffer from malnourishment, from homelessness, and are in living in conditions that have led to the largest outbreak of cholera uh, in the world. Now, as an expert in the war on Yemen, how do you assess uh, the complete and utter silence uh, that is coming or that's actually not coming, anything that's coming from the international community towards this catastrophe in Yemen? 
Um, I've identified uh, three reasons for that. So firstly, the complete and utter silence from the international community is because there is no humanitarian pretext for the US-Saudi aggression against Yemen. Just to remind your viewers, the premise behind this war is that the Saudis are attempting to install the resigned ex-president of Yemen, who currently lives in Saudi Arabia, where he's remained silent since the aggression began in March 2015. To achieve that objective, the Saudis are starving Yemen by imposing a blockade that has left half the population malnourished. Even the leader of the Ansarullah movement, Sayyid Abdel Malik al Houthi, has lost weight because of this. And the Saudis are carrying out this invasion with a mercenary force comprised of 100,000 foreigners, non Yemenis, who don't believe in anything. They're just fighting for money. So there's no humanitarian way of spinning this war, whereas in Syria, by comparison, mm -hmm. the strategy of the powers that tried to overthrow the government was the complete opposite of saying nothing. Instead, they loudly and aggressively promoted pseudo-humanitarian propaganda against Assad to distract attention away from the fact that they were funding the mercenary war against the Syrian government. Yemen is the complete opposite. The aggressors know that any public discussion about Yemen would lead to the audience asking the question, why is the richest and most powerful Arab monarchy waging war against the poorest Arab Republic? Mm -hmm. So there's no conceivable humanitarian pretext here. The second point, is that much of the world still relies on Saudi oil supplies, which means that taking a stand against Saudi Arabia is potentially quite costly. Remember, the reason why the media can get away with uh, claiming that Saudi Arabia is acting on behalf of the so-called legitimate government of Yemen is because that's what it says in UN Resolution 2216. Now, Russia and China could have used their position to veto that resolution, but they chose not to, thereby legalizing, in, in the language of the, the UN, the aggression mm -hmm. against Yemen. Um, so why was this? Perhaps because China is the largest importer of Saudi oil, whereas Russia probably wants to focus entirely on Syria because that's their dominant strategic interest. Mm -hmm. And then it, not only that, we can also ask, why has the Muslim world remains silent and to my mind the real answer is not a sectarian one it's quite simply that the muslim world relies on remittance remittance incomes from from gulf countries like saudi arabia mm -hmm. the uae qatar bahrain kuwait and so on so the financial influence of the gulf states is also another major factor especially on uh, diaspora muslim networks which means that there's a potential cost for speaking out against the genocidal Saudi war. Here in Australia, for example, well, the Australian National Imams Council, which is a yep. peak body, even issued a statement of solidarity with, with Saudi Arabia in their war on Yemen. That's, and the final that's truly point is astonishing. That the war on Yemen. But uh, Jason, we have about three and a half yeah. minutes left. Um, if there's a, there, there was a certain plan, a $4 billion plan by uh, uh, the UN, uh, and it's called the Yemen Humanitarian Response Plan, the HRP, which was directly funding non-governmental organizations, NGOs. We were just talking about NGOs in the first segment and about their imperial role in all of the Middle East and especially in Lebanon. But now in Yemen, after knowing what, what their role is, how can we trust that this money and this aid of the NGOs will actually fix anything in Yemen? Well, you can't trust anything. Uh, does your audience know that the two largest uh, donors are Saudi Arabia and the United States? Now, if these two countries really cared about the Yemeni people, they could simply lift the blockade and stop waging war against the National Salvation Government of Yemen. Uh, the war cost the entire Saudi-led coalition $200 million per day, which means that it would take three weeks for the aggressors to spend more money than what they have donated in humanitarian aid simply by killing Yemenis. And at best, the money that's being used is, is, is cynical. It's a part of the US-Saudi strategy to buy the allegiances of those Yemenis who live under Saudi occupation. And at worst, the money is being misdirected to pay for the military occupation itself. Well, that's, that's really, really heartbreaking, other than the fact that it's a, a humanitarian crisis in Yemen. Now, the conflict is destroying the country's infrastructure, the schools, the hospitals, uh, the bridges, the roads, and even the homes of regular people here, uh, especially because of the bombardment of the Saudi uh, Arabian-led coalition because of their raids. Now, but thus far, all of the generals of the coalition has, they have all failed in telling us, telling the world why they are still bombing the country. Where is the main goal of this war right now? 
Well, the goal behind this war um, has been obliterated by the determination of the Yemeni national resistance. The first goal was to restore Hadi as president of all of Yemen. But if you look at who's taking part in the peace talks now, the so-called Hadi government, that is Hadi himself, has been completely sidelined. Mm -hmm. Rather, the discussions are between Saudi Arabia and the National Salvation Government of Yemen. So Hadi is completely irrelevant, and everybody knows that. Uh, when the Saudis fail to restore Hadi, what do they do? You'll remember that they briefly convinced the former president Ali Abdullah Saleh to betray his country by defecting to the to the Saudi occupation, mm -hmm. but that didn't work. Saleh was killed for betraying his country, essentially. Now they're trying to divide South Yemen between the UAE and Saudi Arabia, so there's a power play going on there, because ultimately it's a strategically important location, and all they care about are the areas that have large amounts of oil, and uh, uh, which they can use to, to blockade the rest of Yemen as well. Well, and one last minute. Jay, uh, well, I'm being told that we don't have any more time. I'm sorry for that. I wanted to ask how you talked to your Western audience concerning Yemen, but I promise that we will talk more in another episode about how the Western audience perceives the, the war on Yemen and how they can help in stopping it. I want to thank you very much, Jay Therapel, who is member of the International Solidarity Committee with Yemen for joining us from Sydney. Thank you for watching the Mideast stream. Please stay tuned next week for more.